Good afternoon, everybody. It's 12 o'clock Central Africa time, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome each and every one of you present today at this very, very important webinar. We will be during this webinar con be concentrating on palliative care within the universal health coverage arena. I just wish to thank two particular individuals right at the outset. The first one will be Mr. Emmanuel Peterson, who's responsible for all the technical aspects of today's presentation. And then Ms. Lucy Bologna from the Cancer Association of South Africa. She's the head of marketing and communication there, and she's been playing a very, very important role, not only in the preparation towards today, but also in this now final presentation of this webinar. We will not be having an open question and answer session, and I would like to request all the attendees, please make use of the chat box, place your questions there, and we will, during the course of the presentation, I will be checking the chat box, I will be making notes of all your questions, and we will see how many of your questions we will be able to answer during the question and answer session. Now, if we look according to what the World Health Organization has to say about universal, universal health coverage, they say that universal health coverage means that all people will have access to health services and it will be those services that they really need, where and when they need them, without it causing them any financial hardship. And it includes a wide range of health services for uh, making sure that all their health needs are met. Then it is important to know that palliative care starts right to diagnosis. Very often people think of palliative care and when they hear the word, they think of only end of life care. And that is not the case. I have a panel of distinguished speakers with us today and you will hear from their presentation how important palliative care is and what it really means and when and how it can be implemented. The World Health Organization tells us that uh, each year there are about 40 million individuals who are in need of palliative care. And an, an amazing number, 78% of them live in low and middle income countries. And worldwide, only about 14% of people who need palliative care really receive it. So you'll see that there's really a wide spectrum of individuals who don't receive palliative care when they need it. Having said that, it is my privilege to introduce to you Professor Liz Guayra. She's from the palliative care medicine department of the University of Cape Town. Apart from being a responsible lecturer there, she is also responsible for support for publications of postgraduate students, and she's a member of the Western Cape Department of Health Palliative Care. Prior to all this, she was previously the CEO of Hospice, Hospice Palliative Care Association of South Africa, and she was also the past chair of the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance. From this, you can hear we've got one of the best people to talk to us about what palliative care really is. Prof. Liz, over to you. Thank you very much, Prof. Michael, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you for the honor of asking me to present on palliative care and universal health coverage. Emmanuel, if you could start the show and you could move to the second slide. Thank you. To slide two. So you'll hear throughout um, this talk about universal health coverage. And I just want to emphasize a few things on this definition of universal health coverage, that it's for all people, that they must all have the access they need without financial hardship, and that it includes palliative care in universal health coverage. So the next slide, Emmanuel. So what is palliative care? Palliative care we could spend a whole day talking about palliative care and what this means, but really the essence is that palliative care focuses on quality of life for people diagnosed with serious illness and for their families. 
And some of the principles of palliative care are the prevention and relief of pain and other distressing symptoms, providing psychosocial and spiritual support for patients and families, and helping people who are ill to live as actively as possible, even in the face of their illness. The next slide. So the World Health Assembly in 2014 passed a resolution that stated that palliative care is an ethical responsibility of health systems, and it is the ethical duty of healthcare professionals to alleviate pain and suffering, whether physical, psychosocial, or spiritual. But unfortunately, healthcare professionals are not generally trained in palliative care. And the World Health Assembly resolution states that all healthcare workers should be trained in palliative care. And this was taken up also in our national policy framework and strategy for palliative care. Next slide. So the international human rights documents speak about the right to health and state that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. It doesn't mean it's the right to be healthy. We can't guarantee that. But what we need is access to palliative care. And the right to health means that health services must be available, accessible, acceptable, and of good quality. And the World Health Organization states that UHC is the practical enactment of the right to health and that palliative care is part of that right to health. Thank you, Emmanuel. Next slide. So the WHO also put out a long while ago, 2007, a public health strategy for palliative care, that the country needs an overarching policy that guides our implementation of palliative care, that there needs to be education of health professionals, but of also policymakers and communities on palliative care, that the essential palliative care medicines must be available, and then there's implementation and palliative care services to um, so people can access their services wherever they are. Thanks, Emmanuel. So who needs palliative care? I show you a very brand new document that's just been finalized this month, the South African Supportive and Palliative Care Indicator Tool. It was built onto the tool that was originally developed at the University of, of Edinburgh. And Leading it was my colleague, Dr. Renee Krauser, who developed this consensus document in partnership with nearly 200 South African clinicians. And it's a tool to help identify adults with life limiting illness when the best available treatment has been given and their condition continues to deteriorate. And it's not only about cancer, which is what people associate palliative care with, but there's also organ failure, there's also infectious disease, there's also neurological conditions. So there are many different ways that we can identify people who would benefit from palliative care. Because initially doctors and patients both think, well, we don't need palliative care yet. Next slide. <clears throat> this document has shown us who needs palliative care, but who provides palliative care? You've heard that the World Health um, Assembly has said that all healthcare workers should be trained in palliative care. So everybody should be able to implement a palliative care approach if necessary. And doctors should be competent to provide this basic palliative care. But many doctors, family physicians, oncologists, pediatricians, specialist physicians should be able to provide generalist palliative care and possibly even specialist palliative care for those people who have particularly challenging and difficult to manage problems. Next slide, Emmanuel. And where can palliative care be provided? It can be provided wherever the patient is, in hospital, in clinics, in CHCs, the outpatient departments, in private practice, in communities, in care homes for older people, children's home, people with disabilities, in hospice and subacute facilities, and in the patient's own home. And we have photographs here of a patient receiving care in the hospice and of somebody attending a patient in their own home. So the next slide. Without financial hardship is palliative care free service. Hospices have tried to provide free palliative care to those who can't afford it. They are funded through donations. 
and they um, have many have had to close because of financial difficulties. This map that was produced by the MRC for us and to for the, w, the Hospice Palliative Care Association in 2010 showed how many hospices there were through the country, nearly 200. We are now down to 104 because of funding difficulties. Palliative care should also be available in public health facilities, in private health care, and it should be funded by medical aids. We have to remember that these are people with serious illness. They're not able to work and to earn, and they're not likely to return to work. They do not need financial distress on top of the physical and emotional distress of the illness. And what we need to realize is that to achieve universal health coverage, we need quality palliative care for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Liz Guare, who is the head of interdisciplinary palliative medicine at the School of Public Health and Family Medicine, University of Cape Town. It now gives me the uh, privilege to introduce to you Mr. Lawrence Mandikiana, and he is currently stationed in the National Department of Health in Pretoria, where he is working as the national coordinator for palliative care. He has many, many years, even as a social worker, which is a noble profession. And he also worked as regional manager for uh, one of the major AIDS projects in South Africa. And he also worked as a district manager for Pop uh, Population Service International. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, Mr. Lawrence Mandikiana. Lawrence, over to you. Thank you so much, Prof, for allowing me this opportunity to present to, uh, to us today, and such a privilege as well to be part of this um, you know, panel of presenters for the um, universal health coverage. Um, so my topic, um, I'll just kindly ask Michael to just light our slides. Thank you, Emmanuel. Right, so the topic which I'll be presenting on today is the rapid response of intensification of palliative care services in South Africa. So this being said, we're going to be looking at policies which we have in South Africa, which are there to intensify palliative care services. And then what is that uh, which uh, the Department of Health is doing to intensify palliative care services? Thank you, the next slide. Well, as we've heard, uh, the definition of universal health coverage, it's actually to entail that everyone has access to healthcare services when they want them. And at the same time, uh, they should not be hindered to access healthcare services because of financial reasons. So that being said, in South Africa, for us to achieve uh, a holistic access to healthcare services, um, we thank God that some of the panelists who are actually who presented in this um, in this uh, you know, webinar, like Prof Guida, she was also one of the authors and um, you know, authors of the National Policy Framework and Strategy on Palliative Care, which stipulates that palliative care patients have access to um, you know, healthcare services when they want them. And then at the same time, the policy is clear to clarify to say we also have vulnerable populations like the disabled, refugees, children, and prisoners, they should actually have access to palliative care. So that being said, uh, in our next slide, we'll be looking into justice and um, the patient charter. So one of the things which delineates palliative care from other frames of, of uh, healthcare service, um, um, you know, continuum of care is the issue of the, you know, ethical principles which guides uh, palliative care, which is the principle of justice. So just this ethical principle, it actually looks at the fair distribution of resources, um, irregardless of gender, race, age, um, you know, severity of disease. So that's one of the principal, um, ethical principles of palliative care. So that being said, it's also supported by the South African Patient Charter, which advocates that, um, you know, in as much as we also have terminal illnesses, everyone should have access to um, healthcare services, and then treatment, which is um, rehabilitation or curative treatment, patients should be able to have an understanding uh, before anything can be diagnosed to them, which means the healthcare um, you know, professionals, they should be trained on how to administer at the same time, how to give out um, news about palliative care. And then at the, at the same time, 
uh, patients should receive timely emergence and healthcare assistance at any healthcare facility, regardless of the ability to pay. So that being said, we're going to be looking into the landscape of um, how this is going to be achieved. So um, I was so privileged enough to, you know, to be working at the National Department of Health with much um, aspect of improving palliative care services. And that being said, we are going to conduct some provincial audits. So what are these audits going to you know, comprise of? We're going to be looking at, um, at the, the audit processes, and then we're also going to be identify focal persons who will be assisting with the audits. At the same time, there's also need to have uh, a provincial readiness um, you know, support tool to being established to say how our provinces uh, rendering palliative care, are they ready? Do they have facilities which can actually, you know, handle the, the pressures of um, the demands of palliative care? At the same time, um, these audits should be completed by February 2021. So that means in all the nine provinces of South Africa, there should be a rapid response pertaining to uh, trying to have a landscape of how services are being rendered across the whole nation. So audit findings, which we get from all these audits, are going to be, um, you know, supported by the Department of Health and other stakeholders. Um, the good thing is that we have other stakeholders like hospitals, healthcare facilities who are supporting palliative care together with the Department of Health. So all these findings are going to be reported back to them, and then we're going to see how best we can actually have, um, you know, continued support of services at the same time, which are coordinated. And then provinces should also identify needs based on population and healthcare facility accessibility. As we can, uh, we all know that universal health coverage, we're actually looking at the issue of, uh, you know, making sure that healthcare facilities are within a five kilometer radius for our patients. And all these things are some of the things which are going to form part of the audit too, and how best we can be assisting patients who are underprivileged to access healthcare facilities. And then, um, the provincial focal persons are going to be identified. Uh, this could be through, you know, provincial directors who can also help us in trying to identify those focal persons. Um, so in our next slide, we're going to be looking at facility coverage. So this is an example of the two which we are going to use. Um, as you can see on the two, we have, um, we have the hospice. Is it funded by uh, the Department of Health or it's self-funded. We're also going to be looking into, um, you know, staff members, are they trained on the National Palliative Care Framework? Uh, we also have um, hospices if they are self-funded or they're actually funded by the Department of Health. Uh, facilities which, which are there, um, how many per province? So this tool is the one of the tools which we're going to be using for uh, audit. Uh, the next slide. Right, so this healthcare facility um, um, coverage too, we're also going to be looking at the names of the facilities which are providing palliative care. So it could be uh, at a community level whereby we have a CHC, a community health center, we have a clinic, we have uh, a tertiary um, health facility, um, a hospital. We also have to notify everything down to just say in this province, how many hospitals do we have which are supporting palliative care services. If we also have, um, you know, services which are not funded by the Department of Health, if it is a hospice, we also have to note that one down. Right, so how are we going to do this? In, in our next slide. Right. We are going to intensify in the east in the aspect of capacity building. So capacity building will be looking at um, you know enhancing training on palliative care in all the provinces. That entails endorsement of training institutes. That includes host, you know that includes hospices, um, universities, uh, private entities who would like to empower uh, healthcare you know uh, healthcare workers on palliative care. So at the same time, there is also an echo platform, which um, has been developed and it's actually active in, in the Gauteng province, whereby cases, difficult cases are actually discussed and dissected by different professionals on how best to improve patient quality uh, of care. 
And then another thing is the adoption of basic palliative care training in all the provinces. So this training is going to be a, a cross-cutting training, which is unique to, uh, to the needs of healthcare workers, at the same time empowering healthcare workers on how to uh, give or render palliative care services to patients. Right, in our next slide, Right, this is the tool which we are going to use in terms of uh, getting um, a landscape of, of how healthcare workers have received training in palliative care. So in other words, we've actually classified groups to say medical doctors, nurses, social workers, social auxiliary workers, and other um, you know, healthcare workers which, which can actually feel or form part of the whole uh, continuum of care when providing palliative care services. So one of the basic things which will be questioning is have they received palliative care training that is the basic palliative care training if not and then we quantify to say in this province we have say for example 500 healthcare workers who have not been trained on palliative care and then in that case with the identified stakeholders who are there to train within those provinces and then we just delegate them to conduct the training and next slide Emmanuel Right, another thing which we have to intensify on is the issue of enhancement of pain medication. So one of the things which we have identified is there is need to come up with a clear, clear cut to say which medications are we in shortage of or which medications should we always be monitoring to make sure that we should not even have a stock out. So which means the first thing of course is just to have an identification of medic medicines to be monitored in this case, which is opioids, right? So we also have to agree with provinces and stakeholders on the processes to monitor stockouts. So it means we have to have access or every healthcare worker within those provinces who is actually palliative care uh, championing, they have to have access to the, you know, essential medicines dashboard, whereby they'll be monitoring to say, um, if it is morphine, how much do we have in stock? how much uh, or what is the demand of the, you know, of, of the medication. That being said, I was actually monitoring some of the key essential medicines, say for example, in Free State, which has a, you know, a dashboard which is gray uh, at 71%. On average, it should be around 99 to 100%. So it's up some of the things which we have to intensify to make sure that we increase access to essential medicines. Next slide. Thank you. So um, to sum up, um, the cornerstone of, of, of uh, universal health coverage, it's one which is summed up by Chris Elias, uh, who says primary health care is a cornerstone of healthcare systems. It helps us to prevent, treat, and manage both infectious and non-communicable diseases, bringing the world one step closer to universal health coverage. So one of the things which we have to make sure that it's palliative care has to be accessible in all sectors of healthcare. It could be primary, secondary, and tertiary. That being said, I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, here you have it from the horse's mouth and you must take into cognizance the fact that what Lawrence was talking about was the future of national health insurance in South Africa. So really, I think this is wonderful that South Africa has taken the initiative to make palliative care such an important part of the whole process of national health insurance. That uh, gives me the opportunity to introduce our next guest to you, Dr. Michelle Mayron, who is a pediatric palliative care specialist and she's based in Cape Town. And she is involved with wonderful programs at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in uh, Cape Town. And she's also involved with uh, palliative medicine programs, a, a diploma, a postgraduate diploma at the University of Cape Town. And she's also responsible as the CEO of uh, PATH South Africa. And then also she's a, an advocate for pediatric HIV children for many years. And she is really a very distinguished and knowledgeable person. Dr. Michelle, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael, and thanks for this honor of being invited to present uh, this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, uh, thanks, Emmanuel, first slide. 
I'll be speaking about universal health coverage, particularly as it relates to children's uh, palliative care. So thank you very much, Liz, for broadly defining palliative care and to my colleague um, Lawrence for also looking at the national uh, South African palliative care policy. So to start off, let's look at what actually is children's palliative care. Thank you. Next slide. So Liz has already sketched the broad definition of palliative care and many of the principles of adult palliative care are also applicable to children. Obviously, the application is often uh, quite different. So in a nutshell, next slide. Palliative care really is the holistic care of a child with a life-threatening or a life-limiting condition that also includes support for the family. And when we talk about holistic care, sadly, often in medicine, we tend to focus on the bioclinical aspects of care, the medical aspects, the medicines. And there's far much more that needs to be done, especially if the threat to life is great or the life limitations are, are, are severe. So when we're talking about holistic care, we're looking at uh, the care of the child's body, the chair of the the child's mind, the psychological aspects or the impact that the disease has on the child. And this is very important in children, especially as there are significant amounts of anxiety in a child who doesn't always understand what is happening to him or her. And of course, also the spiritual aspects of palliative care, all of those existential questions that arise, particularly in young children who don't understand what is happening. Why is this happening to me? And to parents who ask, why is this happening to my child? So very important because it's a very emotive thing when you've got a a child with a life-threatening or life-limiting illness is that we really have to find better ways of supporting the family, not only psychologically, but also very practically and sadly often sometimes financially, because having a child with a life-limiting or a life-threatening illness has significant financial impacts on any family. Next slide. So I think uh, Liz and uh, Michael have already both mentioned what palliative care is not, but I think this is particularly borne out when it comes to caring for children. Sadly, I think because we fought a lot against unnecessary dying in children, we fought a lot in the HIV days to get antiretroviral treatment for our children, and a lot of the SDGs are focused on childhood mortality. It's very difficult for a lot of us to accept that some children do die, both for families and for physicians alike. And that some people perceive that if they actually in, in, involve palliative care, they're actually giving up. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Palliative care never gives up, never gives up on the, on the child, never gives up on the family, even if the child's disease can't be, be cured. And we're certainly not, all, we're not the grim reaper. We're not focusing only on end of life. It's yes, it's an important part of palliative care, but it's not the be all and end all of, of, of palliative care. We're really focusing much more on enhancing quality of life for as long as as possible and then supporting uh, dying when when this becomes inevitable next slide I think a lot of people also think that palliative care is something that you have to choose. And once you choose to follow a palliative care route, you have to forego all, all attempts at cure or even miracles. And this also is not true. There's no reason why we cannot adapt both a curative as well as a palliative uh, intention to our treatment from the outset, from the time of, of, of diagnosis, which also makes for a much smoother transition between curative and palliative focused care when cure is no longer working. I think Liz said some similar thing. Palliative care really at the end of the day is about uh, the relief of suffering and not just physical suffering, also psychological and existential suffering. It's a provision of an extra layer of support for children and families facing extraordinary circumstances. Um, a mom who I journeyed with a few years ago with a child with a rare and very complicated disease explained this net of support as follows. She said it was the thing that helped me to stay sane during my child's unimaginable uh, journey. And for many people, the loss of a child is really probably one of the most difficult things that they would ever have to face. Next slide. Right, so now that we know what palliative care is, I'm going to really talk about how this relates to universal health care. Next slide. It's very exciting, actually, that palliative care is part of universal health care, and it's very uh, encouraging that at this point in the history of, of medicine and advocacy, it actually is a key component of universal health coverage. The theme for the UHC Day for 2020 is health for all, protect everyone. And basically what this theme is unpacking is that 
health should no longer be seen as something that we are wishing for in the distant future. It really needs to be seen as an urgent priority. And the theme this year is really related to the current crisis that we are facing globally, namely the COVID crisis, and that we need to actually protect everyone. We need to actually invest in health systems that protect us all now, not in the future, but now. Next slide, please. And I think we can all agree that COVID has really revealed the cracks in our health systems and where we actually lack protection and where we have fallen short. And there is a significant gap that we have to mind and a gap that we need to address in order to ensure that suffering is relieved and that people receive palliative care as part of the universal health care coverage package. Next slide, please. So some of these cracks, especially as they relate to palliative care, in this health system that is still largely focused on saving lives, a lot of us still don't know what to do when we can't cure. I think many doctors have felt really helpless in the face of a patient dying from, from COVID. It's really taught us that we need to improve our capacity to have honest conversations about patients and families facing their own mortality is such a difficult thing to do. We need to better manage pain and distressing symptoms, especially when we can't cure the underlying disease. We need to have the skills and the teams around us that can provide better psychosocial support to, to families. And where death is inevitable, we actually need to have the tools to provide or to ensure as good a death as possible. We also really need to be able to provide bereavement support. This hasn't been something that has really been part of, of public health care, care functioning, and it's really, really important. But I think more importantly, and I think COVID has really revealed this crack in our system, we need better ways of supporting and debriefing healthcare workers, because if we don't have a healthy workforce, how are we going to uh, keep going? And actually, many of these gaps fall in the ambit of, a palliative, of the palliative care field. Next slide, please. Um, just a few extra ones. Um, I think the mental health care issues have really um, come to light during this pandemic as is something that we have really neglected for far too long. And also had, it has highlighted once again that children are still an afterthought. It's certainly not children and women first. We have seen increasing rates of gender-based violence and of, of child abuse. And I think the impact of lockdown on children, on hunger and on malnutrition it was actually underestimated and insufficiently planned for. Next slide, please. So I'm not saying that palliative care is the panacea for all of these gaps, but I think it does offer uh, significant protection. It offers protection from unnecessary suffering. It offers protection from long-term long -term mental health issues. The impact of losing a child can be, can be far-reaching. Um, many parents suffer from complex grief that can actually affect their, their, their social and their economic functioning for many years to come. It also protects patients and especially children where we struggle to deal with mortality from futile interventions that are inextricably associated with excessive um, health expenditure. And also palliative care can help prevent the burnout that we are seeing in the healthcare workforce. But unfortunately, palliative care is not seen as a priority. It's often perceived as a soft science and the skills that we, we, we teach are called soft skills. Some people see it as a luxury and not as an essential. But now finally, with its inclusion in universal health care, we know that without the provision of palliative care, we are actually not meeting the basic rights of any human being. And the failure to provide palliative care and especially pain relief is actually an infringement on the rights of, of the child. The child has a right to the highest attainable standard of health. And actually the one key difference between children and adults is that this right to the highest sustainable standard of health actually needs to be re recognized now because children are more vulnerable than adults. We can't wait for the progressive realization of, of, of this right. Um, children have the right to dignity and they also have the right to be free from torture. In other words, not to experience unnecessary uh, suffering. They, that often occurs within medical facilities. And I think I'd just like to end with uh, Nelson Mandela's statement. Um, he said that there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it's, it treats its children. And once we get palliative care right for children, we know that we actually are a humane society that ap approaches people with, with dignity and respect that they deserve. So my concluding remark is in the universal health coverage for palliative care, please don't leave children um, behind. Thank Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much to Dr. Michelle Mayring. It was really wonderful. And I think we've now covered more than one facet of life. We've heard right from the children and we've been talking about adults and the rest of the population as well. Now it gives me a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, which will be Ms. Maggie Munsami, who's got more than 30 years experience in the health sector. And uh, she is especially known at the moment as the National Health Insurance Technical Specialist. And uh, she is centralized with the Chronic Medicines Dispensing and Distribution Agency in South Africa. Uh, Maggie, over to you. Rav, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Emmanuel, if you could have the slides, please. So today I'm going to take you through uh, the program called CCMDD, but firstly to give an overview of South Africa, we do have a quadruple burden of disease, communicable, non-communicable, perinatal, maternal, injury-related disorders. We also have the largest HIV program in the world, and we are currently in the 1990-90, hoping to achieve it by in a few weeks' time. We also have universal test and treat, and then we also have the national adherence strategy, and together with the building blocks, which is the EML and the SDGs, also in pediatrics as well. Thanks, next slide. These speeches tell you a thousand words. The long lines, the long waiting hours, patients not getting the treatment on time, patients have to come to the hospital another day. That is why CCMDD was born. CCMDD is ingrained in the NHI policy. It is one of the key elements in improving service delivery. Next slide. CCMDD is an innovative way of delivering medication to stable, chronic patients, harnessing the power of multiple private sector partnerships. CCMDD has been piloted in South Africa since 2014, and it is an initiative that relies on a multi-sectorial approach to support a number of health programs. CCMDD utilizes the NHI concepts to achieve its targets, at the same time strengthening the health system. And NHI is aimed at transforming the fragmented two-tier health system, the private and the public, into a unified health system. Next slide. The vision of health, a long and healthy life. If you have a long and healthy life, then the need for palliative care will continue to grow as the population age. And early delivery of palliative care reduces the unnecessary hospitalization admissions and use of health services. These are the benefits and objectives of the CCMDD. I'm not going to go through all of them, but right on the top, we see that we need to improve access to chronic medication and improve quality. Next slide. This is a high level process of what happens in CCMDD. A patient goes to a facility, they get the prescription and the courier take it to the central point where they dispense it and prepack it and then deliver it back to where the patient needs, either at an external pickup point, in a facility at a fast queue or in an adherence club. So who qualifies for CCMDD? Here, the provinces play an important role in ensuring that the provincial formulary includes all of the diagnosis that they need in terms of stable chronic patients. As you can see from this list, we do have quite a few NCDs as well as the non-communicable disease. And we have also included the children and adolescent. So this is the performance uh, for national. And as you can see that CCMDD has steadily grown even during COVID, we do not see any peaks and valleys. And currently we're sitting over more than uh, 4 million patients registered on the program. Next slide. This slide specifically talks to the chronic patients and the growth during COVID. As we can see from the red line, these are the active chronic patients only, and you can see that's definitely an increase, as well as the sum of the active patients who are in the category of the ARV with a comorbidity. Next slide. So if we have to dig into the NCDs, we see right on top is hypertension. And if we go to the next slide, if we remove hypertension, then we can see much more clear all of the other diagnoses 
which includes angina, diabetes type 2, INH therapy, osteoarthritis, and asthma. Next slide. These are the art patients with a comorbidity. And we look again and we see that hypertension is right on top. If we take out hypertension in the next slide, it then gives us a much clearer view of all of the other NCDs and the comorbidities. Again, we start with diabetes type 2, angina, asthma, and hyperlipidemia, and we go on to osteoarthritis. Next slide. This slide shows us the number of patients that have gone to external pickup points. In the beginning of the year, we were sitting at 36% of patients that access their treatment at external pickup point. And by mid-June, uh, we had already gone to 1 million patients that went to external pickup points to collect their nets and parcels. And now we are almost at 48%. And I'm sure by December, we would be at 50%. Next slide. This is a graphic representation of how fast patients have grown at external pickup points, as opposed to patients collecting at the facilities in house. Next slide. This slide was done in 2019, and I did this to compare what we saw in 2019 in terms of just the, the, A, the HIV and the NCD split. So these are some of the interventions for, for COVID. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but of significance is the children that we had later put on from the 10 to 19 year old. And these are all the interventions that we did in terms of COVID. I'm not going to go through all of them, but they had significantly uh, made CCMDD more attractive to patients, which also included our communication strategy, which we are now calling CCMDD as double up meds, which actually means a shortcut to your chronic medication. I would now like to introduce to you the last speaker of the day, Ms. Uh, Zodwa Sotole, who is currently the Head of Advocacy at the Cancer Association of South Africa, also a person with years and years of experience and several years back in her professional life, her and Professor Liz Gwyther's roads intersected because they were both involved with the Hospice Palliative Care Association. Two things that I want to highlight about Zodwa is that she has for many years been an advocate for the integration of palliative care in the caring of inmates living with threatening illnesses within the South African prison structure. And then very recently, and she's still involved with that, is her advocate work to get traditional healers involved in palliative care when they take care of their patients. Zodwa, over to you. Thank you, Prof. Michael. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it, it's my honor to be part uh, of this webinar. So um, I'm just going to talk about uh, why palliative care is essential for, palli uh, for cancer patients. Liz has mentioned that, uh, and, and, and Michelle, that palliative care is not only for cancer patients. I think you all know that is for all people living with life-threatening illnesses. But I'm just going to focus on cancer patients, which is the part of a, a NCD. Thank you. Next slide, please. I thought it's so important for me just to give a bigger picture globally of what is happening in terms of cancer. So cancer is the second leading cause of mortality, morbidity, and disability. And estimated of 18.1 million new cases and 9.6 million deaths in 2018. There is a highest increase in low and middle income countries, uh, accounting for estimation of 70% of all cancer deaths. Access to cancer services is characterized by in, in inequalities. You can see that in our country. If you look at the public sector and the, uh, and the private, those two things, they don't talk to each other. And also approximately 90% of high income countries can provide access to 
the essential treatment, uh, which is a surgery, radiotherapy, essential and essential medicine for cancer patients compared to the 30% of low and middle income countries. This is really disturbing. Uh, next slide, please. While around 80% of cancer patients live in low and middle income ca uh, countries are only served by 5% global radiotherapy resources. I mean, as Cancer Association, uh, I mean, almost every week we get problems of the patient complaining, having the issues, patients and their families not accessing uh, treatment the radiotherapy machines are broken. It, it, it's patients that have got long waiting uh, period before they start their treatment. Sometimes they, they wait up to three months before they, 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 they access treatment. By that time, the cancer has spread already. Despite the radiotherapy being recommended for around 50% of cancer patients, addressing these uh, disparities will be an important focus within the progressive of realization of universal health coverage. Next slide, please. So when is palliative care used in cancer care? Liz has mentioned that, but I just want to highlight that, you know, palliative care may be provided at any point along the cancer care uh, continuum. Patient can receive palliative care and continue and receive uh, cancer uh, and, and continue receive a uh, uh, cancer treatment. So, how does a person access palliative care? Your oncologist is the first person you should ask for palliative care. I know we've got some of our survivors, our volunteers on this web. I'm just advising you, ladies and gentlemen, ask your oncologist. It's your human right to say palliative care, please. So is there any research that shows palliative care is beneficial? Yes, studies have shown that integrate, integrating palliative care into the patient's usual cancer care soon after diagnosis of advanced cancer can improve their quality of life and mood and also prolong survival. Next slide, please. So why palliative care is essential for cancer patients? You know, uh, this statement, uh, the quote from uh, Dr. Tetros, uh, the Director General uh, of WHO, he said, health is a human right. No one should get sick and die just because they are poor or because they cannot access health services they need. So, so as a palliative care, it's our right, it's a human right. And it is uh, palliative care is a central component of cancer care. And I, I think I've been privileged to work for palliative care. And you know, joining Cancer Association, I've realized how much pain the patient they've gone through and the families before they, you know, they're being uh, attended by palliative care. And to me, it has been such a a, a great lesson to say, let's continue fighting for palliative care. Those patients, they need to access palliative care. And also palliative care, I think that my colleagues have said that it improves the quality of life and also prevent unnecessary hospital admission and the use of health services, especially when introduced early in the cause of the, uh, of, of the disease. If you look at the COVID, the hospitals are full. And also if the patients are accessing palliative care, they won't be, you know, rushed to the hospital uh, emergency room because the pain and other symptoms will be controlled. Next slide, please. So why palliative care is essential? Again, it provides relief of pain. They've said that, but I just want to concentrate on the last bullet that uh, I don't want to repeat what Michelle and Liz have said, but uh, the second bullet I just want to also emphasize is that it is applicable early in the course of illness in conjunction with other therapies like chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Pain can, be, can influence individual health status and can have serious negative consequences. Poor nutrition, 
Can you eat if you've got pain? No. Decrease appetite, abnormal sleep, fatigue, impaired or of daily living activities. Actually, you cannot do anything if you've got pain. Next slide, please. So the initiation of palliative care and discussion of the patient's goal and preferences earlier in the course of the disease can lead to improved symptoms control, reduce distress throughout the disease uh, directed uh, therapy. A patient with advanced and often experienced symptoms of the disease and treatment that contribute to distress and diminish uh, their quality of life. You know, I've seen patients, also I've experienced it in my family where you find that, I mean, uh, my sister once said, you know, it's better to deal with the cancer as a condition rather than dealing with the, the side effects of treatment. So it's so crucial that palliative care should be provided for cancer patients. Pain is one of the most and most fear, feared symptoms of advanced cancer. Pain relief should be encompasses physical, psychological, and spiritual aspect of care. Liz has mentioned that because for me, my experience working uh, uh, with palliative care patients, patients are, are angry. You know, they're, they're wondering why me? Why today I'm dying of cancer? Why today I've got cancer? You know, they're angry with God. And also they're worried about lots of things which can really make their condition worse. Next slide, please. I just want quickly just to go through the barriers to access uh, the uh, opioids. Politically, little political will within some of the government departments. Palliative care doesn't belong only to department of health. Social development, department of correctional services, department of education. Those departments need to support a uh, patient. And lack, of, lack or implementation of palliative care and cancer policies. So we've got policies there which really need to be implemented. And at the moment, we've got a, can, a breast and, a, uh, and cervical cancer uh, uh, policy. So we need more. Clinically, also you look at little knowledge of pain assessment and management fear of appeals, inadequate training of health professionals, little or no interest of palliative care, and stigma of palliative care as a cinema with a uh, end of life. No access to pain management. Uh, so the anxiety surrounding death and dying. Some oncologists believe that palliative care referrals destroy hope and tempering patient anxiety about death. This belief may be caused by lack of education. Next slide is I'm saying, my conclusion, so the process, my last slide. So at the 2019 World Cancer Leaders Summit, government globally recognized how important it is to deliver universal health coverage and to accelerate efforts to tackle the growing burden of NCDs, including cancer, leaving one no one behind must be our core message if we want to achieve health for all by 2013. We need to see government fulfill their commitment they have already made. Last slide, which is the last slide. We need strong health system that are built around people, not disease. Successful universal health coverage can only achieve with strong health system that can deliver the services patients they patients need as, as people, not the disease. No, thank you so much. I think, uh, and I've got a short video, which I really want to play, uh, which really confirm how important for our patient, whether it's cancer or HIV or any condition or diabetes, how it is important to have their pain control. Thank you. Emmanuel, just a short video, please. I think you all, some of you know this video. When you open your eye in the morning, there's nothing but pain. When you sleep, 
There's nothing but pain. People do not understand the issue of pain control. 80% of the people who died last year died in needless pain. You see what's happening? Dying. This is a real crisis. Ah, yeah. <laughs> pain affects everyone, some more than others. Ideally, should be having oral morphine to control the pain, but we don't have it at the moment. If not for the medicine. It's much easier to think about dying. There is a crisis in the world today. Over 600 million will suffer. Morphine is cheap. It's cheap. There is really no excuse for not making this accessible. The war on drugs will never end. The use of prescription drugs for illegal purposes is increasing, it's especially increasing in our youth. Some of the best ERs that deal with cancer, that deal with, you know, painful diseases, and they look at you like you're a drug addict. We have more emergency room admissions for aspirin overdose every year in the United States than we do for heroin overdose. We know that it's not a matter that we need to invest a lot of money inventing new drugs. We have it. The problem is, from a pharmaceutical company standpoint, there's no money to be made. Unrelieved pain is torture. It doesn't have to be like this. You're in pain, you're dead to the world. In fact, I believe that relieving the pain is preliminary to good palliative care. Dying is not a medical event, it's a human experience. We know she's not going to be cured, but we fight to have as long as we can, and, and we fight to have as good time as we can. I don't want to leave him. You don't want to leave him? Yeah. That, that's the most painful thing to think about. Live well, die better. We all have the right to die with dignity and in peace and pain-free. Unfortunately, the reality is that that's not the case. I'm happy that you still have hope. Mm -hmm. mm. I know that you're out of the bed. You know I'm happy. <laughs> I'm just learning. For someone who's facing end-of-life issues, really, if we were to focus on death, there is only one type of death. There's nothing much that you can do about death. But if we were to focus on life, and that's powerful. I want to go on living with medication, with the doctor's help. I'm, I'm okay. The question before us is, how are you and I going to die? Life before death. Thank you, Zodwas. Thank you for sharing that wonderful message for, uh, with us. Uh, I have a few questions that I will pose to some of the members on the panel. But first of all, uh, Zodwa, I want to say to you that there were some points made on the chat box that said, amongst other things, great points, Zodwa. And then another one that just said, excellent exclamation mark, Zodwa. Thank you very, very much, Zodwa. You didn't only speak to our heads, you also spoke to our hearts. There was another comment that's also very important, and that is, it says, the bottom line is funding is needed. I think it's more than funding is needed. I think it must say funding is essential. And I think we all are still very unsure at the moment, especially as far as national health insurance is concerned, of where the funding will really come from and whether we are going to have sufficient funding to provide not only palliative care, but the total universal health care that national health insurance should provide to every citizen of the country. I have uh, the following question that came in and uh, maybe I should link the two of them together. The first question says, and I'm going to respond to that myself, it says, does universal health coverage and palliative care address equity? Now, 
to the person who asked this, and I'm sure that many of you have this question in your heart as well. I'm sure that you haven't heard the word equity really being used expressly during any one of the presentations today, but many, many statements were made that said it's an essential service, that everybody has the right to palliative care. And we know that there is also a right to health care. So I think we can safely say that universal health coverage and palliative care both address the issue of equity. But then I think this question I would like to pose to, to Lawrence, and I'm requesting the members of the, the panel who presented to unmute your uh, microphones and participate with me. The question says, how many people living with non-communicable diseases currently receive CCMDD compared with communicable diseases? And I think this question, let's ask Maggie to start answering that question. Uh, thank you, Prof, for that. Uh, so I think in one of my slides, I actually uh, projected that one. So maybe uh, you can go through that slide, but it is a significant number. And we also seen that uh, there are significant more uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, it's kind of getting closer to uh, the communicable diseases. But also this is a slide that I wanted to show before. It is the patients uh, uh, with cancer treatment on opioid uh, in the program. So although the number is very little, uh, but there is some of them on the program, so which, which means that um, we already can see that some patients are getting access. Then also, if you look at patients uh, with non-cancer treatment uh, with an analgesic, also on opioids as well, and that number is also significantly higher. Thank you, Maggie. So you're Thanks, saying... Prof. Thank you, Maggie. So you're saying to uh, Zodwa, uh, Zodwa, from the Cancer Association side, we've got a lot of advocacy work to do to make patients more aware of the availability of this wonderful service and so that they can really uh, make use of this. Thank you very, very much for that so far. Uh, another question that I'd like to pose, and uh, I'm going to leave this open. I don't know whether Prof Liz or maybe... Uh, Dr. Michelle or whoever wants to answer it. The question is, is universal health care and universal health coverage the same thing? Very interesting word play there. Prof. Liz, would you like to come in on this first? And then uh, we will ask uh, Dr. Michelle to come in as well. Thanks very much, um, Prof. Mike. I, really, this is a personal opinion. I think universal health co coverage is the health system response to making sure that everyone has access to the needed service. The universal health care is what is provided at a primary care level or um, across the levels of care for the individuals. So really universal health coverage is what we're aiming for in order to have equity in access for all people in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, any response from you, Dr. Michelle? And I completely agree with what Liz has said. I think coverage is ensuring access, but the package of care includes promotive, preventative, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative care. That's the package that we want everybody to access everywhere at no cost. Great. Lawrence, and a little question that I want to pose to you is, I sort of made a comment right at the beginning of the question and answer session now, and uh, I said that the statement that was put on the uh, chat box shouldn't just read that funding is needed, but funding, funding is really required and it's essential. What is your response to this coming from the National Department of Health? How do you foresee the avail availability of sufficient funding to be able to provide universal health coverage as well as a palliative care to the millions of people suffering from both communicable and non-communicable diseases. Thank you so much, Prof. Michael. Um, I think it's of fundamental importance to actually acknowledge that funding is, is 
so essential in, in making sure that you know universal access to palliative care is attained in South Africa. So one of the things which I made in my presentation was the issue of audits, just to make sure that um, we have to identify, like Liz was saying, to say there are quite a number of hospices which have closed down, about 200 and odd which have closed down in South Africa. So we have to follow up on them to say why were they closed, um, if it's funding related, how best can we support them? Was it to do with paperwork? Was it to do with um, late submission of, um, of funding requirements or prerequisite application forms? All those things have to be identified so that at least we can revive palliative care services and all those facilities which need funding. So I think it's of paramount importance to make sure that we revive all those um, you know, supporting partners who would like to uh, render palliative care and have financial problems. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Then a final short question to, to Maggie. There was a question. Could I, just, could I just make a comment about funding? Because um, there's this big discussion about funding. We know that palliative care saves the health system funds. And in fact, the Medical Research Council published a report saying saving costs, saving lives, that said if the government paid for primary palliative care, palliative care in the communities, they would save 3.6 billion rand a year. So the funds are there, they just need to be re-budgeted. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you for that, Liz. Wonderful words. I've got a one brief question to, to Maggie. And uh, then I'm going to ask each of the panelists and I will announce you in order that you appeared on the program and uh, be prepared for it because I'm going to ask you within 60 seconds, what is your take home message for the attendees today? But um, Maggie, the question is, what adherence support do patients on CCMDD receive at the moment? Please, Maggie. Uh, thank you, Prof, for that. So on CCMDD, we do have two service providers. At the service providers, we have call centers, and many of the call centers are access to a pharmacist. And then if patients need help, there is an SMS that goes to the patient. Patients also can call the call desk or the help desk at both service providers, so they will be getting some sort of adherence from the program itself. And then with the TLD transition, we also had uh, more SMSs going to patients uh, asking if they needed any other assistance. Uh, so there is quite a bit of assistance for those patients on the program. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. And now my last request to the panel, Prof. Liz Gwyther, Head of Interdisciplinary Palliative Medicine from the University of Cape Town, your 60 seconds for a take home message. So I really believe that people with serious illness should receive palliative care to relieve their suffering, to support their families, and it will save them costs as well as the health system saving them costs. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Mandikiana, your 60 seconds start now. I believe that the groundwork has been done in South Africa pertaining to making health care accessible to everyone. Uh, our policies are in place and they've already advocated for that to be implemented. However, there is need to have a joint cooperation from all stakeholders to make sure that we attain this goal and then we achieve the set mandate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that, Lawrence. Dr. Michelle Mayron, Pediatric Palliative Care Consultant, Pete Spell, Patch South Africa, and University of Cape Town. Your turn for 60 seconds. Thank you, Michael. I just want to make a call for access to palliative care as a basic human right and to consider the needs of children as being particularly vulnerable and that we really need to expedite progress towards making palliative care a priority, not a luxury. Thank you for that. Maggie Munsami, your chance. She is the NHI technical specialist uh, centralized chronic medicines, dispensing, and distribution. For those of you that have forgotten what CCMDD stands for. Maggie, your turn. Thank you. So you can call CCMDD by its new name. It's called Dablap Meds, shortcut to your chronic medicine. My last parting words, and I want to 
throw a challenge to everyone. If you can show my slide, please. So worldwide, about 14% of people who need palliative care currently do not receive it. So in South Africa, let us not be one of them. If each province commit to 5%, we will almost be there. So UCCMDD as an innovative alternative access to medicine. The second one was about the unnecessary restrictive regulations for morphine and other essential control palliative medicines deny access to adequate palliative care. Therefore, I am saying, let us together unblock these bottlenecks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now, colleague of mine, Zodwa Sutole, currently head of advocacy at the Cancer Association of South Africa, your last 60 seconds for this program starts now. Thanks, Prof. Micah. I think my message is the same as Michelle, but I know we've got our patients here, our volunteers here joining on this webinar. I'm saying palliative care is your human right. You need to demand it from your health provider. Let's put pressure on all the sides to say, you as patient, you need to demand your, your, your palliative care as a human right. So that's my message. Thanks, Prof. Thank you very much. I want to give thanks and appreciation to our five very prominent and really influential individuals who participated as panelists today. Really, from the bottom of my heart and from the comments that appeared in the chat box, I can only congratulate you for your participation and the wonderful messages that you brought to us today. And then last but not least, I want to say a special word of thank you to Ms. Elise Joubert, who is the CEO of the Cancer Association of South Africa, for her support for the program of today, for providing us with the wonderful opportunity to use the infrastructure of cancer. And Elise, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And thank you very much to the Cancer Association of South Africa. And then last, everybody, every attendee today, thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very, very much to every single one of you and have a wonderful day and God bless you all. Godspeed.